Welcome to the Good Shepherd in the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Welcome back to the podcast, friends. Today, we are going to be exploring the concept of cosmic education. So this episode is kind of a double dip episode, if you will. It is chapter nine of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues by Rebecca Reutsevich that we started this past summer. We started exploring some of the chapters and over time we would like to hit all the chapters. So this is kind of a continuation of that book study. So this topic covers chapter nine, cosmic education in education to wonder, humility, dignity, servanthood, and hope. This episode also is a continuation of our Montessori series where we are exploring the Montessori roots and foundations and underpinnings that the Montessori movement and educational philosophies have on our work in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and our work with the religious potential of children. So we invited Carolyn Kohlhouse back onto the podcast to explore what is cosmic education and why is it important in religious education. I hope you enjoy. Carolyn, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much. Carolyn, for anybody who didn't listen to your first episode with us back last spring of 2021, would you please tell us a little bit about who you are and your involvement in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Absolutely. So I have uh, been in this work since 2005 when I started my level one training and have been a formation leader for the last 10 years, I think. So Mm -hmm. currently I work with children in level one, two, and three at a Catholic Montessori school. And in the past, I also have worked in the academic side of Montessori, both at the children's house um, and the fourth through sixth grade, the upper elementary level. Mm -hmm. I'm AMI trained both in the primary and the elementary Montessori um, method. So that's beautiful. And where are you? Where are you located? I'm in just the northern suburbs of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Oh, you're way up there. So are you a part of the Minnesota group that was spoken about in the episode on the history of Montessori? So uh, Carol is near me here in the Twin Cities area. Yeah, you're, we're both in this area. Oh, that's awesome. That's really fun that y'all you have a pretty strong community there, don't you? Yeah, we actually in our archdiocese right now have about uh, 50 parishes using CGS. So a lot of formation going on. Yep. A lot of parishes continuing to try and offer this for the children. Wow, that's huge. That's huge. That's yeah, and really along awesome. alongside that, we have two uh, two Catholic Montessori schools up through middle school in the archdiocese. So it's definitely planted deeply here. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. I think I might want to move up there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so, We'd love to have you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it's beautiful, so I'll just have to come. Mm-hmm. So um, we are going to dive into cosmic education, this huge concept. We are going to totally cover it completely in 30 minutes. It'll be amazing. (laughs) And I thought that it would be a great place to start for us to dive into who is this second plane child again that is capable of understanding or touching on cosmic education. So could you speak into a little bit again, remind us who is that second plane child? Absolutely, because this whole idea of cosmic education is Montessori's vision of what meets the needs of this child. So who are they? So just, I think we've talked about this before, but as a review, um, this is the child who has a reasoning mind, Mm -hmm. um, trying to kind of fit in all this information that is coming in. They have this capacity for abstraction, can kind of see like history and space, things they haven't experienced right. physically themselves, and also imagination, like these great questions, why things are as they are, where they come from, how they came to be, just this sort of 
I remember in my Montessori training, we were told you cannot allow them to waste this time because their mind is functioning in a way it will never work again. So mm. just this big ability and capacity at this yeah. age. No pressure. And along with that, yeah, along with that, they also are in this age of social development. So kind of looking from the family out into the world and noticing needs of others and different cultures and just this expanding social development and also alongside that moral development. How mm -hmm. do we care for others? How do we care for our community? How do we live in a way that honors the gifts of all that we've been given? Mm -hmm. um, so all of those pieces together kind of lead us into Dr. Montessori's vision of how to serve this child in their education, uh, which she, she called cosmic education. She talks in one of the books, she speaks about it in so many of her writings, but um, To Educate the Human Potential is a book that probably gives the best kind of vision of this for the elementary child. And she says in that, let us give the child a vision of the whole universe, for all things are part of the universe and are connected with each other to form one whole unity. Mm. So I think the first time I heard the word cosmic education, and Rebecca actually refers to this in Life in the Vine on chapter nine, right. she's talking about this. And she says, cosmic might bring some interesting connotations yeah. to some of us. Yeah. But the word itself really means order. And in a sense, like unity. So mm -hmm. like the dictionary defines it as this complex orderly system such as our universe, like like the universe seen as a well-ordered whole, mm -hmm. the opposite of chaos. So cosmic education being like all things, all parts of the universe and all pieces of education have this like intimate interconnectedness and interdependency mm -hmm. upon each other. And so that's, mm -hmm. you know, offering this big vision to this age of child. Mm -hmm. which is so perfect for the sage child since they're able to move in time and space. And I feel like it meets their need of needing to be interconnected where the level one mm -hmm. child, they're pretty capable of just being solely by themselves. You know, of course they want mother, but they are totally fine playing by themselves, et cetera. But a level two child, a level three child, that's second plane six to 12. They want that interconnectedness. They crave others and they crave their place in the others as well which cosmic education just fills beautifully yeah and that's that piece of social development where they see kind of these social interactions and relationships and they want to know how do i be like how can i be part of that mm -hmm. which again then pulls in that moral development with how do i live well in that so that mm -hmm. i can be part of it yeah absolutely mm -hmm. so we could kind of say the cosmic education starts with having this kind of cosmic vision, like this this understanding of like an all inclusive world. Um, there's a man named Camillo Grazzini who, in describing him, he was an AMI uh, Montessori trainer in Bergamo, Italy, and he, in some ways, was almost like a son to Mario Montessori, who is Maria's son. Right. Um, when Maria died, Camillo kind of took on kind of a relationship with Mario in a almost a familial relationship there. And part of his kind of understanding of cosmic education is this idea of like the inorganic world, the biosphere, human beings, like all of these kind of being interconnected. And then seeing within that a cosmic plan, like mm -hmm. God who has this plan for all of creation um, I, I took a class at the seminary here in St. Paul on science and theology. Um, and in it, we talked about like some things scientists have discovered that when seen through the eyes of faith, just sort of blow your mind at God's amazingness. Mm -hmm. They talk about like fine tuning or anthropic coincidences, which are basically the way the universe is predisposed, has been created in such a way that it can support life. Mm -hmm. Like things like if they were one to the 60th power off, like I don't even know mm -hmm. a name for that. It's far greater than billionth or quadrillionth. If they were that much off, 
like what is needed for life to exist would not, right. it, it would not be there. And so like just the order of all of creation and how good God is in tuning it so perfectly for us, such a gift. Yeah. So the exactness of it all is almost mm -hmm. your proof that there is God mm -hmm. and he has this beautiful plan because of how exact it would have had to be in order for us to be here in the beautiful process and interconnectedness of it all to be here. Yeah. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about two books which reveal, through which God reveals himself, the book of the scriptures, but also the book of nature. And so mm. that we can read his existence and who he is the more we discover yes. in through science about creation, the, the, the more we see just how perfectly he has done all things, which we know, but to yes. see it in these little, you know, little ways is just so beautiful. It is. And I've always felt like nature was such a beautiful reflection of God because it literally is his hand that created it hmm. where um, it, it, through our tradition and even so through, um, stories, etc. There is a human aspect to it, but in nature, mm. it's just God. It's just God telling a story through the way that he created the natural order of things, the way that he created seasons, the way he created seeds that grow and die and then grow and die, etc. Like there's this beautiful message that God is saying about himself through nature because... Um, it, there, it's just, it's just him that created that. It's solely him. I've just always found that very beautiful. Yeah. Well, and when we read that first chapter of Genesis, in some ways we're hearing kind of the same idea. Um, yeah. Camillo Grazzini talks about the cosmic household, so to say, and that like each element that has been created has a particular role kind of in running this household. So even see mm -hmm. like in Genesis, when he says, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. Like there's a role to this. Mm -hmm. Let the waters be gathered here. Let the dry land be here, right? Like even to the extent then of giving man, giving mankind, you know, dominion over these things that have been created, which is like you have a particular role to care for them, but that every element of creation is a part of sort of this well-tuned household Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that we we exist in that we live in mm -hmm. yeah and again i see that second plane child because they're just they're in that why stage like well why this why that because they want to understand why everything does what is everything's role mm -hmm. and then what is my role within everything mm -hmm. yeah and this is that piece of giving the big picture yes. so that then i i been talking about it in training, almost like this, like, almost like a, a rack, like a, a, a long pole that's like a rack. And then they can figure out where do we hang this in this big picture? Where do I fit? Where does Jesus fit? Where does God and his creation fit within kind of this big picture? Mm -hmm. um, not just time wise, but also sort of all of heaven and earth. That's that cosmic dimension. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Carolyn, would you speak into how cosmic education manifests itself in a Montessori classroom? But then let's go deeper into how does it manifest itself in what we do in the atrium? So let's start with the classroom. How does it look like there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so cosmic education within like the Montessori academic environment is looking at uh, this big picture but then from this big picture, looking at different elements of that, particularly as they relate to the variety of academic kind of areas or subjects. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that that's presented is through the five great lessons, which are given early on every year, each year, um, lessons which spark the imagination. They're intended to be maybe exaggerations or sort of anthropomorphizing what's happening, like making it characters in a story, even though it's about sort of the universe or it's yes. about the creation of plants, right? But using the imagination, inspiring, really drawing in the interest of the child. Um, Montessori talks a lot about 
um, wanting to plant seeds in that that sort of soil of imagination that then inspire the child to go out and continue their learning. Mm -hmm. So these five great lessons, um, the first one, God who has no hands or the creation of the universe really lays the foundation for kind of laws within our creation. So um, for example, like how temperature affects solids, liquids, and gases, how gravity um, plays against sort of this expanding nature of the universe. So the idea that even though we, from in the beginning of creation, God didn't have hands, right? Until Jesus was incarnated, we would say God doesn't have hands. Mm -hmm. And yet he has done all of this that we cannot do. Who have hands? cannot mm -hmm. do. Setting these laws into creation that really lays the foundation for further studies in physics, in chemistry, in geology, in geography, in astronomy, but through this one kind of big lesson yeah. that is told with the children. And that's the first one. Then from that, we have um, a lesson on the coming of life and then the coming of human beings from that, the story of communication in signs, and then the story of numbers. So kind of leading into really all of the different sort of typical subject areas, mm -hmm. we would say, within a, an academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, Mario Montessori, when he was talking about cosmic education, he said that basically cosmic education is this, give the child God as he functions in the cosmos to create the earth and give him man who starting to live in nature creates sort of a super nature in which we live today. Not like supernatural, but right, like right. above the nature. So like the houses and the buildings and the right. inventions of our creation. So this big picture from which then to like um, continue to inspire growth and knowledge. I was thinking of some of the children that I worked with uh, in the fourth through sixth grade environment, the upper elementary Montessori environment, they took the story of the of the coming of human beings, and from that, which is very early in the year that we give it, worked all year long on making, writing a play on sort of meet how man, early man met their fundamental needs, how like today we meet our fundamental needs. So they've set yeah. it as a camp, a group who was on a camping trip and they got lost and they had to meet their needs for shelter, for food, for communication. And they wrote this play. And what was beautiful was that it was a fourth grader and a fifth grader who wrote it. And they, when they had gathered in their actors and actresses, they ended up having six children part of it, two fourth, two fifth, two sixth, they came up then with costumes and props, and then they presented it to the rest of the school. So like taking this one story from there, this was their, like what they were inspired to do more research on. So they ended up incorporating kind of science, yeah. but yet also language, mm -hmm. also this whole social dynamic and mm -hmm. service to others in presenting this to them. So kind of taking one great lesson, but then, you know, Right. Incorporating in that, which is very fitting with that cosmic education. Exactly. Idea. Montessori does that so beautifully because it's not like, okay, now we're going to learn math. Okay. Now we're going to learn science. Now we're going to learn English. It's so cosmic in the way that all of the subjects are interconnected, which is the way the world works. You know, like <clears throat> you do, you cook some muffins and you're doing science and math at the same time. Yeah. And it just, it just models, it reflects life so much better because there is this cosmic way in which we absorb and learn from the world around us because it's all connected instead of separate subjects. And that's the piece, even in my Montessori elementary training, they talked about the children really shouldn't know this is a biology lesson or right. this is a math lesson or mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. while we as adults need that kind of order, <laughs> they don't necessarily need that. And it creates like this false dichotomy. Right. I have a friend who said her daughter, when she was in our school and was younger, she would have, so first, second, third grade, she was asked by, you know, family or friends, what's your favorite subject? And right. she, like, she never had an answer because she didn't see things in that way. Uh -huh. She could say what mm -hmm. she liked to work on, but it wasn't related to, well, I like math or I like language because it wasn't right. really presented in that way in her environment. 
Mm -hmm. Or it could also be create a bias towards a subject, you know, like yeah. you say like, well, I hate math. Well, you might just not like multiplication or, you know, you might it's not true. like some specific aspect of it. But when it's applied in all its facets, you, you might like different parts of math. Well, and as a great example, one of my favorite sort of lessons or stories within the Montessori uh, curriculum, there's the introduction to geometry, which I'll admit both of my parents are math teachers. So I have a love for math, but not everyone does. Right. So in this introduction to geometry, it's actually a story told about Egypt and the Nile River and how the like the Nile would overflow each year and wash away like all the boundary markers in the land. And so there were men who who were like paid by the pharaoh who came out and remeasured the land so that the taxes mm -hmm. could be paid. And this this measuring of the land actually taught the Egyptian people a lot about geometry. In fact, mm -hmm. the surveyors used ropes with knots tied in proportions of three to four to five. So no matter how long the rope was, if it was three to four to five, a right triangle would be formed. Yeah. And Pythagoras, when visiting Egypt, actually saw these rope stretchers at work and really what we know as the Pythagorean theorem came from this work. So with the children, then we use a rope to measure in proportions of three to four to five. Mm -hmm. And their introduction to geometry, so geo being from geo, which is earth, and metric means earth measuring. And so like geometry is this field in which we see <laughs> geography, we right. see math, we see economics, we see history, we see language, etymology of language, all into this sort of intro to geometry for the children. So again, mm -hmm. kind of that interconnectedness of all the yeah. subject areas. Yeah, yeah, that it's all united. Okay, so what about in our spiritual work with the children? How does cos cosmic education have a role to play in religious education? So there's one last piece I want to talk about because it leads directly into that. Um, okay. Dr. Montessori talked about the cosmic task and mm -hmm. cosmic work. So she really looked at how everything that's been created serves kind of a dual purpose, you would say. Like trees do what they need to do to survive. Bears do what they need to do to survive. But like in their work to survive, they also serve the rest of creation in a particular way. So Montessori talks about like coral in the ocean that stays alive by drinking in lots of water, letting lots of water go through it. But in doing that, it removes yeah. calcium carbonate, which is actually a poison in the water to build itself, like build the shell of the coral. And through that, it actually purifies the water. So it's not like intentionally yeah. doing it. But in doing what it needs to survive, it's also sort of giving a gift to the rest of creation. We see it in plants, right? They take in carbon dioxide, right. they give off oxygen, right? This idea of consciously or unconsciously for most of creation, having this way of serving the rest of creation. This is that cosmic household kind right. of idea. So then when we begin to look at people within our spiritual needs and our understanding of God, when, when we can see sort of all of the cosmos as being created by God, created as gift for mankind, who then are called to use it well, both in sort of caring for creation, but also in service of each other, there's this beginning to ask, well, then how do I fit within that picture? Mm -hmm. Like, what is my task within this? What yes is he inviting of me? So we often think of, you know, Mary's yes. Would you be the mother of Jesus? Yes. Like a huge yes we are all grateful for. But maybe today my yes is smiling at someone when I, you know, purchase something at the store or picking up a pencil for someone who dropped it. Like some small yes, mm -hmm. a way of loving those around us that we don't know maybe the implications of where that will go or how that will affect that person, mm -hmm. but kind of our role within that. Sophia Cavaletti gave a talk and at an AMI, a Montessori conference in 1991, and she talks about kind of the Bible telling this cosmic tale, like this this history of 
the entire world, the, all of creation, the entire universe, and not just sort of creation, but also God's interaction, not just sort of as the one who creates, but the one who is walks alongside with, mm-hmm. is intimately in relation with us from even before we existed. And so this this big mm-hmm. picture, and we see that in the atrium through really the great lessons of the atrium being the fetusha, the ribbon mm-hmm. that tells from creation through redemption, the blank page we live in right now that we fill with his light, we pray as we wait for parousia. Then another work in the level two atrium, the history of the gifts, where we look again at the same big picture, but look at it as how the mineral world is filled with minerals that we use right? Mm-hmm. Minerals that help us create fire, minerals that protect us from fire, right? Like right. plants that we use for healing, plants that we use for food, for writing surfaces, right? All these different gifts we've been given. And then in the level three atrium, the the kind of great lesson there is the plan of God meditation and timeline. Mm-hmm. Where do we fit within looking kind of zooming in on from the beginning of mankind, through parousia. Mm -hmm. So this, this beautiful kind of look at how all people have in some way participated in this plan of God, but then specifically how the people of God, the Jewish people, and then the people of God, the Christian people have participated in a really unique way called to then share that truth with the rest of mankind. Right. And I always think about in some beautiful way, We started planting the seeds for cosmic education in the level one atrium, even though that child is not ready to move in time and place. We're just planting the seeds whenever we proclaim that's part of the good shepherd scripture when he says Mm. there will be one flock and one shepherd, kind of moving beyond just you, the sheep, and Jesus, the good shepherd, to a bigger flock with everyone, a one flock, and there'll be one flock and there will be one shepherd. It's so true. In in Montessori, we talk about how the level one child, as we would say, the children's house child, receives things sensorially, yeah. and then they receive them again, sort of in the level two child with the reasoning mind. And so there are deep truths that are being proclaimed to those level one children that maybe they couldn't articulate, right. but when they hear as a level two child this idea of the big picture or the all will be united it fits with sort of how they've been formed, even if they could never have articulated it in that Mm -hmm. way. It's more Mm -hmm. that sense impression, so to say. Mm -hmm. And I I think we we do it too with the kingdom parables. We say at the end, we can pray, thy kingdom come, Mm -hmm. right? And just that, just that little bit for the level one child. And then in level two, looking at the Our Father is really this cosmic prayer. It's <laughs> his will be done on earth as it yes. is in heaven, this uniting of heaven and earth and like this, how we forgive others and they forgive us, this this desire for that unity of a well-run cosmic household that we're working for right. now, but we wait for that fullness when he allows it to happen in Parousia, mm-hmm. where all will w- run exactly as it should. <laughs> can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. Amen to that. And Rebecca speaks so beautifully about how cosmic that our father work is, especially in the level three atrium Mm -hmm. and how you bring it that you allow the children to gather things from around the room that manifest that one line of the our father, you know, like um, who art in heaven. And then they go pick an item in the room that kind of represents what that mean, that line means to them and how, what a beautiful, what a beautiful example of cosmic education that that is, that this interconnectedness of all the different presentations or works and things that they've thought about in the atrium, all coming together in this one prayer to help the children have meaning behind these words that we've been saying over and over and over our whole life. It's just really beautiful. I love the way that she speaks about it in in Life in the Vine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that idea of synthesis, we see it in throughout really the level two and three. And this is that reasoning mind of the child. Yes. So faith and life, 
but also scripture and liturgy, right? And there's a taste of that in level one with the Eucharistic presence of the Good Shepherd, right? That kind of u- uniting scripture and liturgy, not being separate, but these intertwined yeah. kind of pillars that Sophia speaks so beautifully about. There's not a Bible that we read in a liturgy that we live, but a Bible that we live the whole of our life, especially yes. in the liturgy. And we see that there, but in level two, we see it with that cosmic dimension of how far does his voice reach right Mm -hmm. all over the world but also through time right Mm -hmm. who are invited to this great feast or the sign of peace in its cosmic dimensions right is this peace that we share at mass the peace we can only share because he is with us just for those physically that we see here no it's for all of his people right Mm -hmm. this desire for that great peace and and this synthesis i think is what we often lift up in their drawings, where they kind of take different elements, right? You see in yes. Religious Potential, the child, the book one, I think you see a drawing of like the Easter candle mm-hmm. standing in the place of the priest at the altar. Mm-hmm. And this like uniting, the synthesizing mm-hmm. of sort of different aspects. And, and when the children begin to do that, there's just such a beauty. You get a little peek into really their deep understanding. Right. I know I've seen it with the like the um, preparation of the chalice mm-hmm. in late level ones. So maybe five-year-olds. I have on multiple occasions had children tell me the water and the wine so close together is the shepherd and the sheep so close oh. together. Like, so like pulling liturgy and scripture so beautifully. Yes. And, and offering that sort of synthesis moment. And I think that's what we do in our lives as adults too. So beginning to see it with the children, it tells me it, this is an environment that has allowed them to make those connections and discoveries. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we desire, right? <laughs> to prepare yes. a space where he can speak, where he can help them discover, you know, the, the, this beautiful intimacy of faith and life of scripture mm-hmm. and liturgy of his relationship with us. Mm-hmm. And it's endless. It's amazing how <laughs> endless it is. The children are able to synthesize the most beautiful things and connecting this work with that work or like, absolutely. I, I've, I think one of my formation leaders, I wish I could remember who basically said, yeah, you can just have them at any point, you know, you pull out the Paschal candle and have the children find things around the room mm. that represent the paschal candle to them or the bible or the good shepherd or you know like there's endless possibilities but the that that's more adult-led but i've seen the children make endless connections you know between the pearl and um the good shepherd or the bible and different things and it's it's amazing to see their mind so easily make these connections in the atrium bet- between the Bible and the liturgy or different different stories that we've talked about. It's it's just beautiful. I think I spoke before, but I had one kid that wrapped the fatusha around the room in a big spiral. And then he sp- went and took things like the whole classroom. I mean, the whole atrium was pretty much stripped by the time he was done because he was <laughs> adding it to the fatusha at different so where beautiful. he was synthesizing, yep. okay, l- the, the statue we have of the lion and the lamb, where on the fatusha does that go? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, you know, parousia for him yeah. or, you know, the Eucharist, the chalice, where am I going to place that? Or it's beautiful. It was beautiful to yeah. see this huge synthesis work that they do. It's, it's amazing. And that's that, that beauty of their freedom, yes. but yet using that time responsibly and yet the freedom of really integrating all of their learning in a way that I don't think any other space really offers to them sort of an enfleshing of what they have come to know. Mm -hmm. I often see it in particular in the Pentecost celebration at the end of the year. We have, you know, if you're looking at wisdom and where do we see wisdom in this space and just the different insights that the children kind of bring to that moment. I remember a child I think it was three groups in a row. I had a child bring a mustard seed to fear of the Lord because it's so small, but it has such greatness and like just the greatness of God's love, even when we are so small in front of him. It was just so beautiful to hear how they have really heard deeply these truths and can articulate them in a way that I can't. 
you know, wow. <laughs> I try, but, but they teach so much within that. Yeah. I would have never thought about the mustard seed with fear of the Lord. I doesn't, the line is something about like, um, realizing how small I am before God, who is so great. And yeah, that yeah. makes so much sense. Of course they got it. Of course they got it. Yeah. And uh, like I said, like three different groups in a row, like it was clear that this is yeah, they got how it. it has resonated with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. That is really beautiful. It's amazing how much this cosmic education in the atrium has affected me. Like as I went through formation, like specifically you mentioned earlier, the sign of peace and the cosmic dimensions, that presentation when I saw it in formation was very profound for me. And it made that part of the mass so much deeper. Like I've never, I guess I've, I guess because of the, you know, the hustle of, you know, shaking everybody's hand and, you know, Oh yes. But, um, that you, that you don't, sit in the theology behind what you're doing, that that presentation brought me to another level so that that part of mass has so much more meaning to me now because of it. These aha moments that by looking at just one, one moment within the entire liturgy almost opens up the entire liturgy in a whole new way. Yeah how that this is our prayer throughout. Um, Sophia mentions in religious potential of the child she she book two she talks about in the eucharistic prayer the prayers of intercession so after the words of consecration we hear um we pray for the dead and with the dead for the saints and with the saints for the church on earth like this how all all people all mankind from all places and all times are united in this moment that we pray with them because we are united in him Yeah, I find that so comforting. Like when I think about the Eucharistic presence presentation, especially in level two, when we have the figures from all around the world. And we like you said before, we talk about is it just for people of today? No, we're we're talking about people who have all people who have ever lived. I find that so comforting. Because it allow it one, it gives us the hope of um, that death is not the end. And it also, there's this beautiful hope that comes with, I'm not alone in my salvation. You know, like we are all so beautifully connected that um, we depend on each other. We need each other. We can help each other in our salvation and in our connectedness with God. And that, and that presentation embodies that so beautifully. And I find a lot of hope in that. It's really, it's so beautiful we see how well God knows us and our needs to, to walk with each other and with him. And in sort of Sophia talks about the mass, like this concentrated sort of moment of we receive all from him and we return all Mm -hmm. to him that we should live throughout our lives. But this too, that we are united in him in this moment. Mm -hmm. I often think of, you know, friends I haven't seen in years, but in the Eucharist, we are united. Yes. And, that that moment of intimacy both with him and with them and what could be more cosmic than that right yes. this all of creation and all of mankind through him united in this particular moment mm-hmm. with the hope of one day united fully in all moments body and soul yeah amen mm-hmm. i know we used to always say um Whenever we were parting, like with missions or whatever, we would say, I'll see you in the Eucharist. (laughs) Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. And what I appreciate also that cosmic education has gifted me is the depth of the mass. Because when you start opening your eyes or training your eyes and your heart to see things in a cosmic way, the mass just kind of like, it's like the doors of the mass just open up to the depth of what is happening. And that cosmic dimension that exists within the mass. And it's, that's amazing. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Amen. (laughs) So many gifts. So many gifts. So we totally have covered the whole concept of cosmic (laughs) education in 37 minutes. It's amazing. (laughs) Or at least touched our toe into it. (laughs) Yes. So Carolyn, maybe you should speak about where, if somebody wants to learn more about cosmic education, where should they turn? You know, the chapter nine in Life in the Vine is a really great start. Rebecca mm-hmm. does a nice job of kind of beginning that, particularly as it relates to the atrium and how we offer this to the children. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Maria Montessori's book to educate the human potential is also a really great place to start in understanding kind of the broader uh, academic side of uh, cosmic education. But I have found most helpful, there's an article by Camillo Grazzini, who really pulls it all together. Um, it's entitled Maria Montessori's Cosmic Vision, Cosmic Plan, and Cosmic Education. And that is available online, like I've been able to find it pretty easily each time I want to see it again. Oh, so the whole article is written online? Mm -hmm. You don't have to purchase mm -hmm. it. That's awesome. Okay, so we'll have true, to put true. a link to yep. that in our show notes for everybody. Yeah, excellent. Okay. And I would say, too, I um, will just say one of the theology books that has really helped me, particularly as this idea of cosmic relates to liturgy, um, The Spirit of the Liturgy by Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, mm. beautifully speaks. He has a chapter called Liturgy, Cosmos, History, and like this, how the liturgy allows us to participate in sort of all of the cosmos. And he uses that word throughout, which mm. brought me lots of comfort when first approaching yeah. uh, this work <laughs> and hearing this word used often. So I would also recommend that one yes. as just a really beautiful overview of the liturgy and its intent of really uniting heaven and earth in this particular way. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And Sophia has a chapter in this, the religious potential of the child for six to 12 year olds, the second edition, it's chapter 10 called our living of history, part two liturgy, the sacrament of cosmic unity. So lots of different resources to dive into this um, deep, deep topic of cosmic education. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us again. I so appreciate you. Such a gift to talk with you again, Carrie. Thanks for all the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I have a lot of links in our show notes for if you want to continue exploring what is cosmic education. So of course we have Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues. If you haven't gotten your hands on that wonderful book yet, um, there's a link in our show notes to that. You want to read chapter nine specifically on cosmic education. There's also Religious Potential of the Child for the 6 to 12 year old, the second edition. There's a link there. And there's also a link to a really wonderful article called Maria Montessori's Cosmic Vision, Cosmic Plan, and Cosmic Education. So I have all of those links for you, plus a whole bunch more in our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.